going to change uh, and then go away from A, Heather. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the time when I feel like Sim Shan and Clinkett and Heidi Cultures are, are working more closely together. Uh, she's in a class that I teach this semester, Alaska Native Cultures, and we went through all the material that the Sim Shan stuff was really buried in there. Uh, and we even did a whole list of, of tribes and, and Metlakat was not on this list, so I felt terrible because I give out this list. Here's all the tribes in Alaska. They deal with the Seattle office, so I got this information from the Alaska office. So um, there's such a wonderful cultural exchange if you look at dances and songs and other things. Um, and so I really thank you for that presentation. Uh, uh, I'm just very proud of our, our next presenter as well, seeing the, the way he has stood up and been a champion for our language. He's a teacher in the schools here, uh, and he's going to talk to us about immersion camps that, uh, that he's been a part of, and, and as far as attending and setting up as well. Okay. <laughs> Cheese, <laughs> Uh, so I started learning Kingit in 1996, to speak Kingit in 1996 at the university. I grew up here in Juneau, and I think I heard almost every day, you're a raven coho from Yakutat. That's what my mom would tell us. She would say that to us all the time. And we would learn phrases, or she would say things to us and sing it. Things like, Kungasia, Kungausaya. <laughs> <laughs> so we heard things and sing it, but it wasn't articulated like the speakers because she didn't grow up speaking it. She heard things from her father who, who, uh, there's debate. Some say that he spoke, some say he didn't, but um, one of my aunties said that Grandpa would be walking down the road in Yakutat and he would be walking with another person and they'd be speaking Kinga and when they got towards his home they would switch into English because they knew that it wasn't for their children to learn. So. Uh, I struggled with having that concept in my mind of the, our language being lost, so I grew up with that emotion. And over the course of the conference, I've heard a lot of what the elders have said and how it was a challenge for them to let it go. Uh, and I think the other side of the coin is as a, as a child wanting to have that knowledge and that that spirit recognized in who we were. And it wasn't until I started growing up and was able to conceptualize my emotions and 
put them into the words that I'm saying now. Uh, so, I think that I can't stand up here alone, and I can't be up here alone because this is not something that's just me. So I would like for uh, my sister and uh, Satuk, Kahina, Shkak, Daskiya, Kune, Akira, Oetsuki, Akadu. I want to make it something that's not just about what I've done, but what about things that we have done together, because it's not just me. was here to sit up here with us because she's a huge part of why I'm where I am today. Uh, so I started learning Kinget from Florence Mark Shakey in 1996 on campus and it was uh, the first time that our language was being taught as a course that would satisfy your degree requir requirements for a bachelor's. And so I was going to school in Anchorage the year before my older sister Dora was going to school up in Anchorage at UAA and she coerced me into leaving Juneau and going up to Anchorage and uh, the first semester didn't go too well and the second semester I started getting more serious about studying and learning and that came through anthropology courses and uh, with Shirley McKendall, who teaches up there, and Gigi, what's her English name, Shara? Buckshot's daughter. <laughs> I forgot her English name. Anyway, um, it was there I started to realize that things weren't necessarily dead, and that our culture was still alive. And so, I was going to go back up to Anchorage for school, and then Patty Atkinson was one of the advisors out on campus, and she ran into me. I was taking summer courses, making up for my failures from the previous fall, and she told me that they were teaching Clinket, and that she said, you should stay here and, and start learning. No, no, I don't want to do that, I told her. And next thing you know, I decided to stay in Juneau and start learning Kinkit. The more I thought about being able to learn Kinkit, the more my soul would waken up, I guess. So that's how I started learning Kinkit in 96. And then uh, Sea Alaska Heritage, back then it was Sea Alaska Heritage Foundation, they were awarded some grants to start immersion camps. And at the time, Roy Mitchell was working with them, and he was the one who was the lead of the grants and organized all of us coming together where we would have courses at the university for a couple of weeks. We could get credit for the courses that we were taking, uh, along with learning the language and also learning how to teach. It was all wrapped up into one big package, I guess. And so, I think it was in 1999 we had our first camp and Kahinuk was one of the speakers that was invited to be out there. 
And it was a really small camp. It, it was out at uh, what's called the Sourdough Camp, and this is a part of the <coughs> Echo Ranch way out at the end of the road here in Janelle. And we boated out from, from the end of the road and then got on this big flatbed and went through the mud and, and the grass to get to this spot where we had to cross a creek on this, what is it called? I can't remember. We had to rope ourselves across, pull ourselves across, and thank you. <laughs> uh, so there were four or five learners, and there were five or six speakers. So there were more speakers than there were learners. And for five days, we heard nothing but Plinket. That was all we heard was Plinket. And that was the first time ever that I had experienced the language like that. And a lot of it was centered around putting up food. We had fish brought down from Yakutat. Fred White was one of the speakers, and he had some fish brought down for us to eat that use and learn how to cut and flay and all that good stuff. Um, and then that, those language immersion camps continued for another three years. And then in 2003, I think a lot of us up here were in uh, Glacier Bay at the Bartlett Cove cabins out there at Bartlett Cove. There were Lots of speakers there as well. Some of them are gone now, like June Piggies, Anya Sikhi, and Shitsinki Ka, Irene Lampy. And I just remember that was one of the first times I could see how us from the younger generation were stepping up to the plate so that we could learn as much as we could. and. We had, we've had a lot, of, a lot of different things going on at the same time. We've tried different strategies. The first camp was really the, the only camp where we spoke nothing but changed it. And so camps after that, there would be a lot of it being spoken, but um, there were, it would get intermixed with English. And that's one of the challenges that we've had in these camps is staying in the language. So um, I just wanted to mention a couple of the other people. Lorraine Adams was at the first camp, and Fred White, John Martin, and Florence Shapley. There might have been one or two other speakers, but I can't remember. And then as the learners, it was myself and Doc Jane, Mary Folletti, Yeh, Vivian Moore, and then I think that might have been it, with the exception of Roy Mitchell, who's the Sea Alaska employee. Anyway, um, after their funding ran out, those of us up here uh, decided to host some uh, immersion camps on our own, and we did this with our own efforts, with our own funding, and on our own time. And so. I just wanted to ask you guys to come up here with me because I can't do this alone. And this is our language and I think all of you have things and ideas or thoughts that maybe you can share about some of the things that we've had to do in order to run these camps. Um, but uh, making sure you have materials and activities is a really big component to the camp because if you don't have those kinds of things, it's really difficult to stay in the language. But um, I don't know if I can just add, turn it over and ask anyone to speak from your mind or from your heart on some of the things that we've had to go through to accomplish what we've accomplished. So, can you go down the line? Sure. Can you teach? <coughs> Dr. Hawks. Uh, trying to recollect 
and being the first immersion camp, I was I was second in command with Roy Utsi Metro. I was a new employee at Sea Alaska Heritage as uh, a language expert and it was quite an honor trying to trying to actually take the language uh, forward and uh, soul searching and saying what is what would be the most important thing uh, to establish to keep just to open the door to get get our foot in the door so to speak. And uh, <clears throat> I left it up to Roy. Roy, you've been in the business a long time. <coughs> you know, he's been in a language uh, and linguistic. And Roy spoke uh, several languages. And he specialized in Yupik. And so we sat down and discussed how can the language survive? So he related to how he was involved with the Yupik Nation and what he did. And so we tried to apply to, to maybe that would work in, with Tinget. So as we developed the, uh, the thought of immersion camp, that we were susceptible to make our mistakes, a lot of mistakes. But Roy and I decided <coughs> it's okay to make mistakes. <coughs> That's how we learned. We were just happy that the door opened. It was a beginning. We knew that our words would eventually go back into the homes and Hans is right. Most of our young teachers were involved in that immersion camp. We try to put instill uh, confidence, competency in having a start with the language. And we knew that it was going to be beneficial to to eventually uh, it would reach the classroom and we needed to boost the young teachers. So we had Florence Shakely and we had a lot of elders that were very comprehensive. So what I did, <coughs> I tried to turn it over to Florence I always call her sis. She is, she's the master in dealing with grade K through 12. And the elders that were new, that would step in their classroom, not being able to, to say one word in the head. So to me, it is honorable to, to yield to her <coughs> and what was surprising was she then turned around and said, John, you can't read. So then I said, Roy, you're, you're our master. I'll do anything you want me to do. And Roy said, you know, John, you're the speaker. And so the ball was bouncing be between Florence, myself, and Roy. And so what we did <coughs> was we wanted to, my thought went back to how we were <coughs> elders. Where did the language begin? It probably began with sign language. And this is where Roy highlighted the concept of TPR. An example, <coughs> he would point, and I 
dock, a cable. Simple terms, higher critique. I'm getting ahead of myself. When we came to Echo Ranch, we were told there were a lot of bears around us. And uh, Echo Ranch actually told all of us uh, what the concept of Echo Ranch was, that we would bring in fresh water every day, and we would get all of our, uh, our uh, garbage brought out because of the bears. We take it across the river. And so we were comfortable with that. But our camp was near a river, the Sand Creek. So Sister Florence asked John, why don't you offer a Hindu prayer that we would protect ourselves from uh, bears, uh, interfere with our mission to be able to try to we still uh, the finger protocol um, and all of our students, our, our cooks and, um, and what have you. So we said a prayer and all of us, I asked all of us to think about that and the way our elders did things. So that's how the immersion camp began, to try to keep it as simple and not set our goals our expectations too high. And so if we performed with a low performance, that the frustration wouldn't be so great. So simply we did, we, we used, we began simplifying the thing in terms, uh, whatever we did. And uh, Roy was good. He pointed at the salmon, Hot, theta. And we were also, Hans was, Hans brought, uh, brought a drum, a drum kit. And each of us had projects to do. And we tried to identify the terms of our projects. The utensils, whatever we had, we started to say it con uh, continuously uh, so that we knew what Sita was, Kasha Kasha, which is the, uh, what do you call the name? Scissors. Scissors. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is where the origin began. We were a family, um, and the respect within our group was tremendous. And uh, so, all. I'll stop there, and maybe Florence could add to. Uh, we hated to leave the camp mm -hmm. because we just started. The cohesiveness was setting in. The thinking language began. We knew that it was just a seed. So now I listen to Hans from day one. I listen to his thinking. You know what? His his language is beginning to be so methodical. Must be really the smoothness of his presenting. Uh, he doesn't go. The thing in language is so free flowing, <coughs> and that's what I'm hearing from my grandson. So the impact of the immersion camp, I think, his thoughts always referred back to the foundation of his involvement in, in what he has learned 
in college, I said, the Boston thing is. And so I hear, I inquire every so often, he's a great teacher. He's an ambassador for the language. He's an ambassador for the Sikh culture. And he's given a name to the school, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. To be able to carry out a potlatch, to gather enough the elders, and give him proper recognition. Those gifts, I still remember his potlatch. Giving it to, the, uh, to these invites with the clan. So I'll stop there and turn it over to whatever you think. Um, thank you. We're talking about um, immersion and just sort of our experience of immersion camps and, and what they've been. Uh, I, I want to make sure that we wrap up in about 10 minutes so that King Beastie has time for his presentation. Um, so we're just sort of talking about the experience and um, what we think about. Well, one of the things that I, I heard John mentioning was that uh, it's real important that you go in as a family. The speakers, all of us, um, we all we all became one when we were out there. We all uh, respected one another, even the uh, people who were the natural speakers and the ones that were learning. <coughs> One of the things that came to um, my attention was that we had to all speak and get to the students. They couldn't understand us. And the one thing that came to mind was our ancestors. How hard it must have been for them to be thinking speakers and to try to communicate with the people that came in from outside. <laughs> the part tears to my eyes at how hard it was for them thinking about it. And um, all the things that we did out there were things that uh, were important to our people. <clears throat> our food, we did a lot with our food. And uh, Ruth, Ruth Demmer was also out there. And, uh, and I always enjoy Ruth Demmer. This my, I always call her my older sister because she's Kachadi is what Kukapadi were before they became Kukapadi. And um, the emerging camps are really, really important to our learners, all of our learners. I don't think if it was for the uh, culture camps, uh, some of them wouldn't have the knowledge that they have now today. And uh, being exposed to the speakers is something that they really need. And even our little ones. I go out and uh, work with uh, not some with the children and. Uh, Good job is all I can say. Really good job. And then I had opportunity to take uh, Jessica's place while she was uh, when she was going to have her babies, working with all the little ones. I had a crazy notion that I wanted to uh, have a job all day teaching kids. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> This is for me. <laughs> but I really enjoyed it. And again, Jessica, job well done. Teach. And uh, our brother John is always a uh, blessing for us when he comes to our camps and everything. He tells the uh, younger ones things that are important to the Lincoln people. My seat here keeps looking at me, so I think he wants to talk. Rabbi, 
Yeah, <laughs> Immersion. Immersion. All I said was, we are emerged right now. And I acknowledge my kinsmen that are here. We are emerged. Why would I name Yak Tat, Tlokwan, Sitka, and all the different communities, Skagway, Tenneke? It's like we are emerged in our language, in our ways as a people. Our people gave those names to those communities, and it's like we're nested in that places that we come from. Community, And so I want to express to everybody here, everyone that's here in this room right now, how much I appreciate the immersion that I'm experiencing right now. Sometimes we get our minds set in a way that closes off the doors. I want you to know you're immersed in the spirit of being singed right this very moment. It's not at a camp, although it is. It's not in the classroom, although it is. We are immersed in the history and the culture 
of being thinking. So I'm going to stop and and uh, let my brother or whoever's going to speak next speak. So I'm going to speak after this, so I don't want to give everything away. <laughs> <laughs> I want to acknowledge as well immersion uh, uh, we were talking yesterday too about how would you say immersion in Tlingit and I couldn't think of what I said it's like we're swimming along in the bottom of our language. And the more I thought about it, I said, I, as I was sitting here listening to, to my elders and then to, to Nakafal, who's my, he's my young elder. He always teaches me such good things. Uh, and I want to say Gunachish to Nakafal and Sefud and Dash Jinni for just visualizing we don't need a bunch of money, we don't need a whole bunch of process to have immersion. We had an hour and a half of solid clinket yesterday. Uh, some people were getting mad at me because I was running around grabbing all the speakers. But it's just, <laughs> what are we going to do? We can't, we can't do this without them. You know, um, and for me, that's the only thing I see, is pulling them together so I can be with them and speak our language. And you have to get a little bit selfish with it, like that. Uh, but I think there's a, there's some really good processes to <coughs> uh, that you can apply anywhere. You, it could happen right here, right now. It could happen anytime. Uh, a couple of things is going slow, probably, if you've got some newer, uh, younger speakers, uh, younger in terms of how long they've been exposed to the language. So you're, it's like when we soak in the water for strength. Uh, Kate used to tell me, she said, that's what you're doing for our people. You're soaking in the water for strength. So you go in a little bit at a time if you've never done that before. And after a while, you just go, you know, so and as far as a process, you'd say, okay, we're going to go for you know, 30 minutes, then we'll come out, then we'll go for an hour, then we'll come out. So you can speak English and people can take a breath. But after a while, you realize that you're salmon people. You don't need to come up for air. And I realized that in Glacier Bay when I walked by, these, they were dead pot, there was no way on earth they were speaking Klinket. But we've been doing this about three, four days, and I thought, sounds like Klinket to me. <laughs> and so your, your brain switches over, but I had crazy headaches because that English was just gripping onto my, into my brain. And that's what the elders told me. And then uh, I thought I was kind of going crazy to take these crazy naps. And, and then we're, we're in this room, and the cooks are right next door. And Kaseh uh, leaned over to June, and she said, sounds like they're speaking clinking in there. So I knew it wasn't just me. <laughs> so if you go a little bit at a time, Ken uh, Wadabat, one of the clinking students, had another good idea. She said, you think of the core. You've got your fluent birth speakers in the middle, uh, and, and physically in, in the space. And then you've got your advanced speakers, the ones who are really speaking, right around them. And then you've got your intermediate speakers around them. And then you've got your beginning speakers. But that, that way your beginning speakers aren't completely intimidated. There can be some back and forth and teaching going on. But your most critical things is your elders and your advanced speakers making sure those speakers are getting everything they can right now because we're, we got a timeline. We've got a serious timeline to, to transfer as much as we can and create a, a pocket of fluent speakers who are then are going to teach others who are learning as you know, English as a you know, clinket as a second language. It's a slightly different process. Uh, so having things up on the wall so that you flip it over and say, now we're in immersion and you, you find people money for speaking English. I think that's a pocket <laughs> shot. <laughs> Put money in at one time, and you give people like dollar bills, and you have to one out of ones, and then so you got to put a five in there, and I put a five in for Kehune, and she talked for like 20 minutes and clink it, and then she didn't speak any English. The main thing is when you go to immersion, you learn how to be funny in the language, you learn how to have fun. We were sitting there, and I was trying to say and clink it, do you want it? 
a walking stick when we go down on the beach. Kick it up. So, no, I don't want one. And then uh, he had a tumble, and then so we put a bandaid on, and it was on his hip plane, just this one. <laughs> <laughs> he turns around from the beach. He says, "It's all bad." <laughs> so, you know, you have so much fun that you. The, the worst part of immersion is the last day because you know you've got to go back. But the, the key is you take what you've got there and, and you push it out and you just, you just be a salmon for salmon people. You just stay immersed. In it. And I think it, it, it really helps because you're, you're not going in for an hour at a time and then going back to it. And I was talking about, were you talking about Glacier Bay? Oh. Yeah, Glacier Bay, we were there for what? 10 days. 10 days. And uh, when I came back, my husband took me um, out to eat. And I was sitting there eating, and then I looked up real slow, looked around. They were all speaking, saying it. <laughs> and I, I noticed they're all, but they're all white people. But to me, they were all speaking, saying it, because I was the same thing he was doing. I was flipping it around. And making them speak like it. And that's what happens to you when you're, even sometimes when I'm, my brother Johnny was notorious at doing that. When you would hear somebody say something funny in English, he would fly away, he would flip it around and make it say like it. And we miss Johnny a lot, you know, because he had, he had a lot of sense of humor and uh, lots of funny things. That uh, sayings. And all the culture camps that we've had, every one of the culture camps that I've attended, they've all been tremendous. Everybody, we, they all don't do the same thing. So there can't be a real model. It just has to be what you want to do. You want to start a camp, it has to come from your heart. Come and change. And I think the one thing, too, to know about these immersion camps, so many of us live in different places now. We have our friend, young friends up in Yakutat that are nice core team, and we have our friends in Ketchikan. So we don't see each other often enough. So these opportunities give, give us opportunities to hold each other up, to help us continue to rekindle those friendships. We might not see each other for months and months, but we internet all the time, um, and we call each other on the cell phones all the time. But these, um, I think, give us that little oomph that we need to continue to do what we're doing for the next generations. I, know, um, I have, haven't had the opportunity to be able to participate in the immersion camps, but I do want to extend a thank you to them for doing those camps because if they don't continue doing that there, as somebody who doesn't doesn't get the chance to be able to participate, I wouldn't be able to be where I'm at today because I learned from each and every single one of them um, our grandfather's language, our grandmother's language. And I wouldn't be able to continue teaching the human language in the school system without their help and their efforts to make sure that it, there's something new that can come up. So I just wanted to say, uh, a couple more, and we're going to turn yeah. I worked at Sea Alaska Heritage for a few years, and we uh, coordinated some um, immersion camps. And uh, the uh, problems that I saw with that from a management point of view was sometimes people came yeah. and expected yeah. to be entertained. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, that's pretty tough when we're trying to have language going on all the time. And then the other is, um, I remember being in Huna, and really we started off that trying and trying to be in the language and making a speech to the community about if, if we don't respond to you in English, it's because we're trying to be in the language. And I was standing with my aunt, my, my wonderful aunt, and um, we were talking to one of my cousins, and I talked to her in Tlingit, and then Irene said, Aunt Irene said, talk to her in English. I said, we're supposed to stay in Tlingit. Said, but she doesn't understand. And I remember Roy, Roy Mitchell saying that languages have been lost because of politeness. Mm -hmm. 
that we're being polite to each other. If somebody doesn't understand, then we want we don't want them to feel uncomfortable. <coughs> so expectations of what you're trying to do in your immersion camp um, is really important, I think. And and having immersion moments, you can have an immersion moment, and especially if you're sitting next to somebody like Katrasa, and it could be one word, one phrase, that's an immersion moment. And you know, if we add up our moments, we're, we're gonna have them. But it's always, all the immersion camps I've been to have been wonderful, and they've also been so disappointing because there wasn't enough thing to and I'm just, I'm one of the worst ones, you know, I want to learn a lot and I don't know how to fling it, so then I'll talk in English. So, just be prepared, keep doing them, but be prepared for the high and the low. Um, I think that the work we all do with bringing our language back and trying to speak it at home or in public, it's really heavy. <coughs> like, I, I can feel it in my heart. The need to continue yeah, to share what you know. Yeah. And so when we come together, just like I said, it's so important that we come together and we laugh. And mm -hmm. So one thing I remember my mom was telling us is that she would hear people speaking Pinkett and they would always laugh. Yeah. And that it was something good and it made you feel good. So that's, I'm grateful for everyone for, you know, sitting with me, and, you know, even if I don't understand, I'll chuckle because everyone else is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope it's not about me. <laughs> but it's a great time to come together. Just like everyone said, it could be little moments here or there. And to have that experience, it really changed me. I didn't go to the first one where you guys camped really hard. I heard camping. I was like, mm, maybe not. <laughs> but I did go to. <laughs> and um, I went to Glacier Bay, is where I met. I met Satouk there, and and it was an amazing time to come together and just just to have that feeling of, you know, we can do this. We can speak our language and. I remember just Coffee Shot had her Quaker Oats, you know, and if <laughs> you spoke English, you had to put that money in, and, and at the end, we gave it to the workers, because we stayed at Bartlett Cove there, and we gave it as our tip to the workers who were serving us. They made the food and stuff for us, and I just remember there was one one lady from down south who who just, you know, said, and she cried. She goes, it was just amazing hearing you guys, and so it's it's a real good feeling to be a Maybe in winding down, uh, just a quick comment. Uh, it's hard to segregate the little boy in me. <laughs> Believe it or not, I took French in uh, high school. Uh, it was quite an experience. I think about it when I'm speaking think it and when I'm trying to instill Thinget into uh, those that want to learn Thinget. And how we got by in French is our French teacher was a, uh, a veteran of World War II. If we didn't finish our, our homework and we're getting ready for a quiz, we always like to bring the subject of uh, World War II stories. <laughs> so the, our teacher used to tell us a lot of uh, World War II stories. And I think about it when I'm trying to teach Thinget. Uh, what I learned from, from World War II stories rather than French is it was really gratifying. What he was telling us <coughs> that the Japanese invented the moon and were, uh, how they tried to bomb the uh, American tanks. So the, uh, the guys that were running the uh, tanks, now this is his word, not my word. He said that uh, the first motor would, would hit in front of the tank and uh, our Americans were saying, whoa, those guys are, they don't know how to shoot, you know, they, they're missing their tank. 
And the second one would be behind the tank. And so the Americans also learned after we lost some tanks, wait for the first one and the second one, then make a, a you zinc and then you zag. <laughs> <laughs> so as I grew older and trying to be involved in teaching, I thought to myself I would apply that concept. That's a part of my French class that's helped me is what I'm saying. Uh, you know, we used to joke around with French and say, the, the simple words, you know. And, uh, and then we learned how to really speak French by naming uh, Chevrolet, Coupe, Cadillac, Coupe de Ville, <laughs> stuff like that, and we had fun. But the concept of French class, our, our, our teacher was, he, he taught us something. It's okay to make mistakes, like the how they zeroed in on our American tanks. So I apply that as myself. I try not to be too stringent. And our students make mistakes. And we pronounce things differently. You know, and some words are the same. Like we say, Kluge, that's wolf. And then we say, Kluge, that's the hill, you know, a little hill. And so that's the way our language is. So you may not be perfect, and even I make mistakes. And so to me, I was involved with Dusty Young and Robbie at, and uh, I call it the Washtunky Camp. And it's uh, actually, uh, uh, they have an allotment outside of Sitka. What a great place. And uh, we had one in Yakutat, Glacier Bay, and uh, Echo Ranch. Those camps were all gratifying because we can see the products, the products of the students at the camp. That is the most gratifying, rewarding thing that, that I carry with me. And Yakutat was, each camp was different. And uh, to me, I think all of us that are sitting here are products of the immersion camp. And so this morning, we talked about the clan and being involved in African of the language. And what our students and what our children appreciate most is the immersion camp has provided a carry for the students and say, we want to give them the best methodology of teaching. And uh, <clears throat> if they pronounce words uh, a little different, I would ask them, you mind repeating that again? You know? And so <clears throat> the learning began. And today, uh, I'm, it makes me happy when the youngsters are speaking to me again. And uh, yes, the language has a good chance of surviving because we're caring people. The teachers are caring people like Malkasad and the sisters and Lance leading the charge and Sister Florence and David Katz, his emphasis on learning in the classroom. It gives us more strength than Superman or Captain Marvel, the, the intelligence, the learning mechanism, especially the thing get, gives it more strength than we need. That's beautiful. Because, why is it beautiful? Because the thing that students know who they are, what they are, their ties to the land. The language instills the ties to the land and learning the skills of speaking. They understand now. They have a place in this world. And they're happy because they're carrying a single name. And that if we accomplish something in teaching, those are the mechanisms that makes them proud to excel. They're not beaten down in a classroom. Even if they're, if they shake them up, to instill the learning, 
to, to, to turn the lights out and learn it, there's some ingredients that make them proud, and that's a language, and their names. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Richard. So David Katzik is on the agenda as well, and, and we can have to get to his presentation. I, I feel compressed for time, but we've got all afternoon to continue this discussion. Uh, that's the, uh, so if we I'd just like to say uh, I'm sorry that I didn't write you up there because I feel like I'm very slow in getting up and down. But I feel that yesterday you guys opened up another door when we got together here and Klingitu uh, Atangi Hawush Tutu Dach Tutu Hawt. And if you looked around your room yesterday, there are people that understand but afraid to speak. Okay. But if they listen and they, and you guys encouraged them to speak and my little friend here said that when we got through here, she felt like crying because the lady that spoke last, you know, she she was so emotional about speaking her language and everything. So there, I think if you had more classes like that, and they hear that, that's encouraging uh, for them uh, to get up and speak. And I introduced Robbie because uh, She's got a thing, but she loves the language, and she teaches it. And she's been working at it for a long time. To hear her speak, then we give encouragement to others to speak too. <laughs> Speakers should correct it, but you know, not say it at the time the speaker is speaking. I myself make a mistake like John said, and I don't mind being corrected. So, thirty-four people yesterday, and we were ninety minutes entirely in Plinkett.